Okay, now we'll take a look at the logarithm function in the complex setting. So section uh, 3.30, the logarithm function. So the plan now is to um, <clears throat> find an inverse for the exponential function, e to the z. Of course, that's a problem because e to the z is a periodic function with period 2 pi i. So we'll have to cope with that. And remember, who's to blame in all of this periodicity stuff is polar representations of complex numbers. It's, it's the fault of the argument that introduces this periodicity. So the last thing we did at the end of the previous section was observe that if we take a non-zero complex number z, then z can be written as e to the natural log of the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z. So right here is certainly a candidate for the natural log function in the complex setting. Of course, the problem with that exponent is it's not a single number because it involves the little a argument. So it's a whole set of numbers. So this will cascade down and lead us to initially define logarithm as exactly this. That's a problem because it's not a function. And that's what the next definition says. If we take a non-zero complex number z, define, you know, it pains me inside uh, to say this, define the multiple valued function log z equals natural log of the modulus of z plus i times arg z. Little argument. Okay, so the right hand side is infinitely valued. <clears throat> so it's not really a function, a multiple valued function. There's no such thing. Functions have unique outputs. We could deal with it by it being a set valued function and saying we get a set of values. We just get one set of values. So that would be consistent, but we'll make the most of it in terms of um, Brown and Churchill's terminology. Uh, and then I ramble on in the notes about the tragedy of a multiple valued function. Uh, so what we're really getting in this previous definition is um, a multi -val multiple valued function uh, in the same sense that little arg is a multiple valued function. But we had capital A arg, uh, the principal argument function, which was indeed a function, and that'll lead us to a principal branch of the logarithm. So principal will play a role here, just as principal played a role in the setting of arguments. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, take a unique value of arg z that lies in the interval, negative pi to pi, including pi, excluding negative pi, and denote it by capital theta. Then, this is how Brown and Churchill define this, uh, define log z to be the natural log of the modulus of z plus i times that principal argument plus 2n pi, where n is any integer. Uh, this is equivalent to what was given previously. This is just the notation explicitly that Brown and Churchill use. Um, theta, capital theta here is the principal argument of Z as mentioned. Um, and we've got the same problem because N can be any integer. We've got this multiple valued function thing. Uh, but we're gonna use this idea to define the principal branch of the logarithm. Uh, and a passing comment, this interval from negative pi to pi isn't universally accepted in terms of choosing a principal value for capital theta. Uh, the graduate course uses a text where they actually take the angle between negative pi halves and positive three pi halves. And it's still a range of two pi in terms of arguments. Um, but the, the cut, the branch cut, it will be called, comes at a different place. So in here, this is the plan. Uh, and certainly we have e to the log z equals z. 
taking this as our definition of log. For any value in an integer, you take the corresponding number and we'll get this, we'll get this equation satisfied. E log Z equals Z. Okay, uh, one of the examples from the previous section uh, dealt with uh, one plus I, one plus I. We found all Z such that E to the Z equals one plus I. We found that such Z values would be of the form natural log of the square root of two plus pi over four plus two in pi for the imaginary part times I. Uh, N being an arbitrary integer, so no problem, all numbers of this form where n is an integer satisfy this equation, e to the z equals one plus i. So in terms of this log function we just defined, quote unquote function, log one plus i is a natural log of the square root of two plus uh, this argument part. So this would be little a argument of the one plus i complex number. I like functions, we need functions. And we'll define, so in, in a sense, I interpret this as our definition of a log function. It's called the principal value of log is the based on um, the argument of z, which lies in the interval from negative pi to pi. Uh, it depends on the principal argument of that complex number. So we define the principal value of the log as capital L-O-G, kind of analogous to capital A-R-G when we were dealing with arguments, um, log Z equals the natural log of the modulus plus I times the principal argument. You know that that is a possible choice for a function that will act as an inverse function of the exponential. Now we could also tack on a uh, two pi I on here That'd be another candidate, another branch, we'll call it in the next section. Another candidate though for a log function, which would act as an inverse of the exponential function. Now the benefit of capital log, principal value of the log, is that it's a, <clears throat> it's a single valued function. So it really is a function in other words. And the relationship between the principal value of the log and the log z function is defined above lowercase l is that log z is the principal value of the log plus this two n pi i stuff due to the periodicity of the exponential function. Yeah, I, if I were me, which I am, I'd find it more appropriate to write it maybe as a set and deal with all this multiple valued stuff as set valued functions. But here's an alternate, uh, really mathematically cleaner way of dealing with it. Uh, suppose we wanted to say to um, deal with uh, z equals one and find the log of one. Well, log of one ought to be zero. Let's see what happens with what we have set up here. So take z equals one, which of course has modulus one. Its argument is two n pi, where n is an integer, its principal argument is just zero, because it's real, uh, when, when n equals zero in this little set, as I've written it. So if we take lowercase l log of one, we'll get the natural log of one plus the argument, the two n pi i stuff, the natural log of one, here we're dealing with real logarithms. The natural log of one is zero. So we're left with the two n pi i stuff. And again, n can be any integer. So the lowercase log function, lower, lowercase l log, produces this as the log of one. And you knew, because it's a multiple valued function, we were gonna get out a whole collection of output values. More appropriately, if we look at the principal value of the log, that's when we'll take n equal to zero because that's when we'll take an angle between negative pi and pi. It's coterminal with one of these. And that's the angle zero. Uh, we would get out that the log of one is zero. So this part's consistent. Maybe a passing comment here. Um, 
in this book, Brown and Churchill is using ln to represent the logarithm, the natural logarithm function that you're used to from calculus. Um, little log for this multiple valued thing that they've introduced, this monstrosity. And capital log for the principal value of the logarithm. Now, there is no log base 10 stuff in any of this. None of these are common logarithms. They're all natural logarithms. They're all logs base E of some flavor or another, but they're using the LN notation from calculus to indicate when we're dealing with the real log function. They're using capital LOG to indicate the principal value of the log function. And they're using uh, lowercase LOG for uh, my proclaimed monstrosity that's a multiple valued function related in a certain way to the principal value of the logarithm. So only natural logs, uh, somewhat of a delineation between the real ones and the complex valued ones, and then my complaints about multiple valued functions. You knew this was going to happen. It's because of the periodicity of the exponential function that we can't necessarily choose a single value. Well, we can, just like you can choose a square root to be a single value. Uh, the square root of nine is three because that's the square root of nine. Of course, negative three squared is also nine, but by convention, the square root is chosen to be something called a principal square root, which will be akin to a principal argument in a principal branch of the logarithm, uh, if we use all that terminology. But Speaking of, you know, we haven't even taken square roots yet. We've, well, I take it back, we've taken square roots of numbers, but we haven't dealt with a square root function. We've taken cube roots of numbers, but we haven't had a cube root function. There's a lot of stuff that seems still to be done. And the reason we haven't done any of that stuff is because we need logarithms to do that stuff, which, uh, well, it's gonna come at a price because of this multiple valued stuff. If we've got more than one choice for the value of a logarithm, we'd have more than one choice for values of square roots. That's where the plus or minus stuff comes in. We'll pick one, a principal value, and that's where positive square roots come in in the setting of real numbers versus the negative square roots. And so logarithms. So let's move on to the next section um, where we'll explore the logarithm a little bit more.